Hello everyone, today we talk about Mediterranean Union or division uh, during essentially Roman times or Hellenistic times um, and this is a topic I think we addressed here and there when discussing about there's a video made some month ago was uh, called Mediterranean hegemonies uh, that took you know a bit of a broader look especially from a temporal point of view uh, we observed it in there's another video I think I made it's the the European dimension of the Roman Empire that discusses the you know the definitive continental orientation of Augustan policy right the, the expansion towards central Europe that would was to stay fundamentally from from Mediterranean there are broader um, issues let's say when discussing this topic that of course today we cannot cover mm -hmm. and uh, today we'll take a look a bit at if you want the prejudices that exist um, that existed also at some point right you know that were created from you know for, for a certain time you know from the 18th century mm, to the 20th well into the last century in fact um, the, the idea of sort of of coin the idea that the Mediterranean is some, was something homogeneous they, in this especially in Roman times this was just like a lake of commonality where everything kind of blended in and you know differences somewhat didn't exist or that there was a, a unity of mindset and of communication um, also there is still in modern times deriving probably from from modern contemporary prejudices this idea that you know uh, th there is a Mediterranean uh, a pan Mediterranean idea right like people I don't know if you look at touristically speaking and people say oh, look at couscous and paella you know we are Mediterranean we're all like you know similar to each other like ah oh, look at how you know Italian sa similar sounds to, to Spanish even though you know actually uh, they're they're importantly diversified languages or you know think about how we sometimes associate the idea that the Romans got so what of Hellenized at the point that everything was kind of of Greek you know and then there was no difference at some point or um, uh, even from an ethnic point of view uh, this this is a concept that encompasses actually uh, also the, the views we that that we we have of medieval history such as the idea that fundamentally uh, the northern coasts of the Mediterranean at some point were ravaged by the Saracens that dramatically altered the you know the even from a from a genetical point of view if you have an idea of the you know demographic balance between Europe and North Africa you realize how quite much it, if anything it's the contrary not just because this happened in ancient times but also because banally just like Phoenician colonies also the Saracen ones weren't Demic colonies, like instead the Hellenic ones were, but even in there, uh, where did the Greeks stop? Right, you know, can we say that I don't know in Gaul, um, the southern Hellenic polis had a dramatic impact on Celtic society? But uh, no, right. Um, from a historical archaeological point of view, we see that there is nothing properly like that. The Hellenic mindset was very, um, let's say, exclusive in a sense. They they really thought to live within their own city and their own. That had a range that, of course, space in the Mediterranean, but not, for example, much in the interland. This is true in many areas, right? Even when we hear of, you know, I don't know, um, Celto Atlantic or Sarmato Atlantic or uh, Italiot or, you know, and it, this is, you know, um, this is an important concept that uh, we we will have to see better at some point. Uh, Hellenism, of course, is this also great rush towards the east and the great syncretism that indeed happened from Alexandrian times especially in the eastern Mediterranean mm -hmm. with important uh, influences also in the west for sure because the Alexandrian experience was not and that's why we talk about Hellenism in proper it was not just you know eventually a Greek thing right it was the uh, the Hellenic culture managing to encompass, to, to, to acquire an ecumenic dimension that integrated all these other elements. So, I don't know, if you take Ptolemaic Egypt, that's for sure the most syncretistic of all the, uh, the Adoki kingdoms. Um, and even in there you see that w how much did actually Greek culture even touch certain uh, local elements, right? Uh, 
indeed it did, right? Like in many other places, or you know, f think about the Seleucid Empire. Think about the commu properly the from an ethical point of view, the Greek communities that existed even in and even before Alexandrian times. Think about the Greeks of of Bactria that were there, settled there. They were m m mainly Cretans, if I'm not wrong, settled uh, by the Achaemenids in in uh, at that point. Yeah, I don't know how to say, probably Central Asia, not even the Middle East anymore, um, geographically. Uh, so a very different dimension also for, from the, the Mediterranean one, in spite, you know, the Achaemenid Empire, of course, reached uh, as far as Greece. Um, but, um, uh, let's say, something that that was already, uh, that, for example, fought back Alexander. I mean, you know, if there was a kingdom of Bactria that rebelled, you know, that seceded fundamentally from from the Alexandrine legacy, it's because those Greeks had a very different mindset from the one of, of the Macedons at the end of the day that were imposing essentially a monarchic model that discontented even the same Macedonians at, at a certain level. Um, so this is perhaps a very important key of interpretation. It's it's the idea that um, what we see from a from an historical point of view is is all we need to know. Um, there has been a great emphasis, trend, fashion, whatever you want to call it, on the concept of late antiquity in this kind of sort of uh, cauldron of, of melting pot of, pot of cultures that, you know, so what was defined, it was a real civilization on its own, right? And we, of course, through it, we're, we're acquainted to the, the various cultural elements that make that, but I think we give too much for, for you know, we observe too much like the grandiose things, the great mosaics, the great villas, the great temples, the cities, right? But we often forget that that wasn't all that world, right? There was an interland. There were, there were, the, the wide majority of the population was actually out of that reality. Um, at least with those specific characteristics, of course, uh, there were important changes in all this time. I mean, areas like Spain or Gaul, uh, I mean, began to speak essentially a romance, a Latin-derived language, even though they, they spoke uh, you know, previously an Iberian, Lusitanian, uh, Celtic, uh, etc. Um, and even non-Indo-European languages, think about the Basques or so on. But the, the the concept here is that we often look at essentially the uh, the elite, right? What produced more, what, what left more evidence, right? It, it's the world of the cities. It, and incidentally, for exactly for that reason, it's the world of the sea, right? All this objectively did derive from the Hellenic polis, right? Not even the Greeks actually created all that, right? We know that essentially European civilization started from Near Eastern influence. Uh, Greece had a, a dramatic uh, Near Eastern influence. I mean, even the Iliad, um, you know, what, what indo europeistic sometimes like, you know, this was a pure indo Now it's crumbling in a sense. I mean, there is much of that. I'm actually one of the advocates of, of you know, a continuity of important uh, Indo-European, uh, let's say, perspective approach to certain things because it's th 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 there was kind of a backlash and said, oh, no, it was nothing of that. But if you objectively look at, uh, you know, the Near Eastern epos, contemporary to more or less when the Iliad was, began to, to be, you know, at least passed down, uh, uh, the, the the analogies are striking, but basically they were the same values, the same ideas, and guess why? Because at the end of the day, societies of those times, independently from geographical, were similar, right? And they were even very close. Uh, the city isn't born in Europe, and uh, the Greeks and the Romans built uh, essentially uh, uh, the, their empires on cities, right? Um, and 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 that's what we and. Yeah, I mean, especially for the Mediterranean, of course, that's mostly an Hellenic thing because the Greeks colonized, right? Uh, the Romans did too, but naturally the, the concept of the city is something that they somewhat emerged from even, okay, as Romans because that's what defines properly the Rome, the belonging to that city in a political sense. So that tells you how deep they think, but it was, it was not a, a direct copy of Hellenic models either. We've seen it... Uh, uh, I think in depth when discussing, for example, even the the political, social, and especially uh, and military, mostly at least in on Schwerpunkt uh, organization 
of, of, of the Romans that is something very, but I mean very different from the Hellenic world, was unique in its kind, right? There was not never a copy of um, the properly Hellenic, you know, speaking properly of the Greek motherland, uh, um, Athenian, Spartan model, not even in, in the rest of Greece, right? There was never such a thing like a, a tr anopolitic warfare, for example, like we see in, uh, you know, in classical times elsewhere, right? Being equipped or armed like a hoplite doesn't absolutely mean that you fight like those, and there was nothing like that. But still, in in fact, between the 18th and the, 12th, the 20th century, up to very recent times, think about Hansen at the so-called uh, Reaganian hopletism. This idea that it was a sort of standard pack of Western stuff that was replicated and that is the, f the, the full foundation of something never existed before is a bit, you know, we should be cautious about, uh, at least. Um, not because there is not a Western specificity. Mm -hmm. There was, and this especially has to do w in the history of thought, and definitely the Greeks there did make the thing, right? But it's not all, right? Western culture, Western identity derives from that, right? Also because it began fundamentally like that, but it, could, it would have not been the same thing, for example, without the... Uh, Roman civic model, without uh, the Christian freedom of conscience, without even certain elements that, as we were saying before, were apparently choked, like, you know, the tribal element in all this, the Indo-European waves of conquerors from, from the steppes from all of which, you know, the Indo-European branches eventually originated, this kind of military obsession with the conquest of the world that was actually the only purpose of any civilization at the time. I mean, the Roman Empire is, you know, recognized as the greatest Western, you know, achievement in a sense, in, in a in an ecumenic sense. Um, some would say the church, but the church is a polit in a sense. I mean, it, it, it's spiritual. It's not you know properly a people, um, probably meant. Uh, was founded exclusively as an empire on on a military and religious principle alike. Right. This is what, this is true. I, I don't know even for the Alexandrian Empire, etc. But what we have struggled. To, 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 to accept today is that, you know, things like, you know, um, political uh, equality, civic duty, um, you know, individual rights, etc. were born in a world that still considered this exclusively in a sense that in, in, in the case of the Romans, it was for the first time the, the actual extension to, to everybody would, would be worth of it. Uh, that is to say, every it was there was a, an implicit recognition of uh, a potential, uh, you know, uh, uh, universality of, of all human beings, and eventually that—that's where Christianity expanded dramatically, especially in a, uh, you know, in, in a humanistic sense. I mean, stating for the first time, you know, that things like I don't know, slaves were human beings, which before wasn't actually believed, right? Um, and but this was essentially a militaristic, expansionistic, uh, systematically, this, you know you know, slaughtering and, uh, and devastating reality, right? It was capable of integrating as much as erasing from the his from the face of the earth, right? Today we live with what we have for Roman times, you say, oh, much, we, we know so much, we're so lucky if we have the Roman Empire, we have all this information. Yeah, yes, we do. But part of the reason why we have that is also that there are lots of peoples that existed there where they're on the map, today, today we consider real realities, and we know nothing about because they were exterminated t till the last one, right? And not because the Romans were more or less evil than others, but because the Romans were m more more capable than others. And and this is uh, something that is also difficult to understand. The Romans were just, uh, you know, as, 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 you know, they were probably a people in the sense, if not from a political point of view, but they were just a tribe of, of all the others, of all the bloodthirsty, enslaving, systematically brutal, repressive, uh, that that made it, right? And when others complain, say, oh, well, the Romans conquered others, exterminated, yeah, I mean, they succeeded where all those other people that were exterminated were wanted to do, that is exterminating others in the same process, right? So the myth of, of freedom, of the noble barbarian, a good savage, it's just bullshit from late modern times that we've vented as a sort of romantic revanchism, also to justify uh, colonialism, a bit winking at, you know, the subjective back at that point. 
uh, the ancient world was anything like that. You know, if you have any myth in terms of uh, humanistic standards of the time, just know that whichever people you pick, and I mean every single one, was just and solely based on ruthless conquest, extermination, rape, and enslavement of all their kings, right? Look at the Celts or the Germans. That's exactly what they, they did all the time long, without any stop. I mean, they literally did only that. And thinking at this broader system as, you know, there was a good or, you know, or bad guy is uh, it's just not flattering for an average human intelligence, right? And this is something that is very difficult to understand today when there is literally hunger for saying, you know, there was some purity back in the day, you know, that people was the righteous one, was the good one, was the most advantage, was intrinsically the one. They're fundamentally racist, um, crypto-racist, if anything, concepts, right, that we have to emulate, right? This is all the, and it's pretty disturbing that Western civilization, that is the most advanced in the world, with all its faults, etc., that it, still, yeah, it's still the better, um, uh, feels the need at a popular level to go back literally to the lowest forms of that, that is the, the most radically violent, uh, unjust, uh, literally uncivilized, right? I am a, a, a strong supporter of the concept, there is a civilization, the civilization is no joke, it's no invention for justifying um, massacres, or but th those cannot be erased, that, that is not how it works, the thing, the thing is that literally, if you're a civilization, you're more developed, you're more capable, you're more um, mentally and materially resourceful than another, right, you're more organized, you're more intelligent, because when you, you learn that you can't do more with what you have by not adding but by multiplying but you know having a concept of combination in mind it can extend it achieve more results you're, you're literally i mean this is maths this is physics you're more intelligent right and it's not that those who weren't uh were because they were less intelligent it's just they didn't have enough capacity at that point it had either a uh, few local resources have that didn't have the means so maybe they had but they were taken over look at the greeks with the Romans, uh, the same goes for the eventual decline, even of 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 an, let's say ancient civilization. It is something that objectively ended, unlike the medieval one that literally evolved into the Renaissance. That is, our modern achievements are actually a medieval achievement. Um, uh, the ancient world shrank at some point, right, and that has to do also with the, those material bases. Right? It's not just about the ideas, it's also about the fact that we're, these were very fragile systems, intrinsically, right? and they, uh, they could be shocked by things like you know, major pandemic, etc. Uh, it, it wasn't easy to you know, uh, innovate in these realities, because there weren't many options. Right? If you think there could be a, um, an industrial revolution because of uh, you know, Hera's steam engine, you probably have no idea why even the, the Industrial Revolution happened in, in 18th century England. Uh, because uh, technology, you know, discovering something is not innovative, and you need, uh, uh, you, you must have a, a particular spin-off, uh, a base, in order to do that, right? You, you can't start building trains and, and uh, you know, uh, steam uh, ships and so on in, in the, in, in the Iron Age. That, that would have starved to death everybody. Like, you know, the Chinese did to, with a great leap forward. That caused the greatest, uh, you know, uh, death, you know, number of death in the history of mankind. That tells you also how these are literally ideas for which every single human being should wake up in the day and feeling ashamed to be human just for the fact that they happen, even if that single human has nothing to do with that. And that's the kind of mistakes that unfortunately do have, you know, we're properly, you know, horrifyingly impressed in, in, in reality to show us how bad ideas they are and why they are bad ideas and why things do not work that way. Um, so, this is not the first time I give you this disconcerting scenario, but you have to understand that civilization happens step by step. You can't complain about the fact that a civilization back in the day did some horrifying things when the world had literally not learned that, you know, those things were not really the best option, right? Because first of all, there were conditions for which that thing had come to happen, especially considering it was universal uh, at the time, that is, nobody differed, and that step by step somebody added more, and then we, we realized, we began to realize that there are better ways to do things, right?
Um, and unfortunately, we fight against... These are prejudices literally stemming most... You would be surprised by 19th century positivism, right? It's not even the Enlightenment. It's not even, uh, let's say, mm, nationalism per se. Uh, let's say even the diametrically opposed thing. It's literally the 19th century positivism that, that by the way, flirted and actually married into pseudo-scientific racism uh, at that point with the idea that fundamentally there's a people that is dumber than another uh, uh, at the origin of it. Not that we are all learning and that, of course, there's somebody that for some reason does it faster because it's either, you know, uh, you know, you can't really predict how it's going to happen, right? Uh, unfortunately for diamond, <laughs> you know, guns, germs, and, 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 and steel. Um, this, is, this was unpredictable. Like, literally... Uh, things like uh, the, ex the the same existence of Alexander the Great as a person changed the history of mankind at such a radical level that you know you couldn't even properly tell what we would be today without that. Um, the, the Persian Wars, right? Uh, the Second Punic War. Yeah, I know there was all view that says, "Oh no, the Romans were were you know you know were to to rise since the Battle of Centinium, they were now the man." No, they weren't. By the Second Punic War, they, they consistently risked right to have to be fragmented once again in an Italic, uh, you know, in all the various tribes, and they you know th there was a possibility of things going straight. Well, um, the same goes with Christianity. Right, C Christianity could easily not happen. Right, do you know how many other religions were, uh, how many sects? of Judaism existed around there didn't make it well Christianity did make it and that it made a, a hell of a difference in a way that even in there you can't even begin to imagine how how deeply affected the history of mankind any simplistic explanation to say you know things would have gone this specifically because this was bad and this was good you know it means you're not really familiar with historical inquiry in the first place um, Mediterranean history is complicated because it was intense, right? Uh, we don't know much exactly what happened and how. We're lucky to be, of course, better documented than other areas, but at the same time, this idea that there was a greater unity, I, I tell you, pan-Mediterraneanism didn't exist, never existed, historically speaking. The Mediterranean has always been more diversified uh, historically than, say, Northern Europe easily um, it, it's something that derives from from a set of conditions of course uh, that were mostly pre-crest right these political systems were not capable of literally unifying everything the Roman Empire was not a, a modern nation state where everything was alike right even those that you know uh, are uh, tribal fanboys uh, that would like to make you understand this huge empire that uh, you know globalized everybody because that's the propaganda by the way uh, that that made all alike no it wasn't like that yes tons of languages died but you know guess what you know they they you know it's not that the Romans went there and eliminated them right uh, they came to pass because you know people believed in into the empire at the end of the day uh, had not much of a reason to keep using them. Yes, entire tribes were exterminated, but those were essentially, as we were saying before, uh, doing the same things that the Roman were. That is, bullying their own neighbors, and simply they, they were weaker than the Romans. And you know, by keeping to 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 do that too frequently, got exterminated. It happens. You know, look at the history of mankind. It's exactly what happened with Chinese and their neighbors. It's exactly what happened. Well, China in different ways, of course, because it was more compact. Europe was different. Europe was diversified. It doesn't have a major river that encompasses everything that allows to control the whole continent. There are major, there are major mountain ridges. Um, there are different climates. There are different cultures it's exposed to. Uh, there is the steppe. There's the same Mediterranean. There's Africa. There is Asia, right? So uh, this definitely strengthened also the. If you wonder why the West began, I, I was asked recently. You know. Um, you you have to carefully look at these differences because if you think that the Roman Empire was kind of a flat thing that, you know, uh, cancelled every difference or that was living all of that ideal, uh, you you lose actually great part of its richness, and especially what happened before and later than that, 
right? Because there is no doubt that that informed, especially you know, a certain the the, the dominated part of Europe, in a way that would have not I don't know allowed the Carolingians to raise the way they did, because that was all because of the Gallo-Roman Latifundia that allowed them to do something that no other uh, Romano-Germanic people eventually would do. Um, this uh, helped dramatically the spread of Christianity. This uh, gave uh, an infrastructural base, right? Uh, a common language in many cases, or at least a capability of relating to a common language. Um, so all aspects that uh, coexisted with important differences and therefore looking at the Mediterranean where objectively civilization in here arrived from at least to Europe because there is no other way to, to explain European history frankly uh, the, um, the the process was non-linear was not you know as long as it was the Empire everything was static or there weren't differences or the same end of the Empire is should be read, in my opinion, with a great, but I mean a, a very great attention towards the local differences, right? Not just because the Romano-Germanic kingdoms eventually emerged from realities that were already kind of on their own. I mean, let's be honest about it. In, in the West, it's especially evident. But the reason why those kingdoms existed in the first place is that there was a, you know, a post-Roman base. Right, you don't think that somebody arrived and began to rule with iron fist. You know, they immediately blended with with the local aristocracies, without which you couldn't even make a state work, or writing a, a code of laws, or you know, keeping to administrate was actually remaining of Roman times. And, and in fact, there is this prejudice that I really struggle against at many levels. That looks at most at, at the Mediterranean as, um, you know something that was either united or fragmented as if you know a, a unity could even be possible that at some point the Mediterranean was closed it was a, a sharp uh, break right with the previous times later times um, it's like when we talk of I don't know the Islamic invasions Islamic invasions did cause important damage to certain areas but if you look at the broader development of those same areas they turned out to, demo to be the most advanced in, in later times what did happen uh, actually, there was a greater continuity. Um, we made multiple videos, for example, on the Saracen invasions, where we explained this. Um, some things are evident. Uh, nobody uh, actually claims. We made a video on Piran's thesis, and we have demonstrated, historiographically speaking, that the great contraction of late antiquity happened before for the, the, the Islamic times, especially in, uh, you know, in, in um, it's even at both in the western and in the eastern Mediterranean, to be honest. Like, it's that the west was l even less advantaged from before, right? Because it was not so uh, rich and, uh, and uh, dynamic as the east, right? Where also, in fact, the empire kind of continued its life and even survived the Islamic onslaught. Um, but there is a dramatic continuity... And this is extremely evident, especially, I would say, in the Islamic-dominated uh, areas with the pre-existing regional realities. I mean, you can't understand Islamic history if you don't understand that Egypt fundamentally opened their doors to them. That these were all Christians. The Spain, is, the Caliphate of Cordoba is fundamentally a continuation of previous systems that, you know, even Roman Africa, Tunisia, fundamentally, was, was, was again, a center of, uh, of an important culture. For example, it was different from the, the rest of the, the North African... Uh, interland so nothing is simple right and I always mm, counter this dramatizations of history the same uh, they, because part of the reason again why we reason like this is that between the 18th and the 20th century the, the, the dominating thought was mostly um, uh, essentially an, uh, um, an Anglo-Saxon one that was very influenced by the fact that Britain had, let's say, the closest thing, probably in all Europe, considering the pre, you know, the, the Roman times and post-Roman times, l to, to a dark age, right? And that, given the preeminence of Anglo-Saxon culture, especially in the 20th century, uh, you know, you know, th this this thought w informed, right, most people in the world. I mean, I, if you pick anybody, right, from any context, like most. Westerners actually believed there was a dark age, a big crack. Most, I don't know if you know if you look at, but 
uh, uh, worlds that have not really had that much with 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 the anglosphere in general. I think I don't know. Think about Latin America, etc. You know, th those are imbued concepts. Like there, there's not another area of the world that kind of came up with another idea. M more or less, at a popular level, we still believe that. Hmm? Whereas, if you look at the Mediterranean perspective, you see that this discontinuity is is very debatable, right? If there was a contraction, that, that happened pretty much everywhere, right? It's not that when the the, the Roman, uh, the Western Roman Empire collapsed, you know, who, who had conquered those lands was faring that better, uh, or in a, in other areas of the world things were going. There was a broader crisis of sort. It was long, right? We debate dramatically today in determining how much and how because we literally do not understand we don't have the data do you know how, how for example how much debate there is about i don't know the the effects of the antonine plague right there are people who say you know it was a catastrophe uh, there were other people who say you know basically there is no evidence it it you know weakened particularly the the productivity of the empire um we we sometimes don't even know the effects of illnesses of the the fall in agricultural so we we talk s too much in deterministic ways right we have decided a priori substantially that something happened that way because we heard somebody saying that and then we still we, we're still struggling with struggling with our own history so um thinking that there was a disaster happening in late antiquity um is is something that I have great problems with, right? And uh, leaving aside, it was a very long time, but especially the concept of the end of a Mediterranean unity is confusing because from one side, probably that never existed, and if there was a contraction, better of traffic, etc., because there was definitely a contact, there was definitely an element, a, a common Mediterranean element for sure, but that simply shrank and it didn't disappear. Right, uh, the great routes with the east never cease. We we know that, we know that from colors of manuscripts of you know places you know stones that could arrive only from Afghanistan. I don't know, in the eighth century, we know that that route existed. Right, there was somebody literally making the travel from from Afghanistan to to Francia for that. Right, and there is, uh, or at least you know, there was a traffic with different knots that made it arrive there. So. It's very, very problematic, the least, to, to say this. And for that, I, I really address you to the Piran Tezos video I made, I don't know when, recently, at some point, maybe last summer, that explains a bit what, what's the deal with that. Um, the sea, because I, I dedicate this video to it fundamentally. So, the seas join, they can be seen as great highways. Because indeed, it's much easier to travel by sea than by land this time. And um, in seas that, however, divide as well, right? You can't deny that <laughs> the first reason, if you, if you put so much effort in the fact, you know, building, shipbuilding, you know, even the risks of the cross and so on, it's because, yes, it's convenient, but still, it, it takes some energy, right? Um, and it costs a lot. So, of course, the Mediterranean played both roles at the same time, right? And bringing together, but also diversifying. And, and this is important because the Mediterranean was rich, right? It was low, it was literally the, the most fertile area around. Um, and it, it, it therefore allowed, yes, to have context and therefore to learn faster, but at the same time, it allowed also to settle, to, to grow more, and in ways that naturally were influenced also by the inter the relative interlands, right? Spain is is not Italy. Italy is not Greece. Greece is not Anatolia. Anatolia is not Palestine. Palestine is not Egypt. Egypt is not uh, Tunisia, etc. Um, and this is pretty evident. I mean, look at the Mediterranean today. How how similar are those countries, concretely? Uh, very few. You have some, of, you know, some. Of you know, not very developed countries, at some point some are very developed countries. Um, you have different languages, different uh, religions, different confessions, different, uh, you know, ethnicities, of course. So, um, and, and much more than you have in, uh, in the rest of Europe, for example. So, uh, when, as moderns, we 
um, we we look at this problem. What did the Mesa rain actually bring in that sense? Is that um, there is an ambiguity in the way we relate to the same topics because mostly we do it for reasons that have not much to do with historical inquiry. Um, the, Mediter the concept of Mediterranean, for example, it's uh, up to some point, up to Solinus, as we will see now, it didn't even properly exist, right? Um, it, and it's kind of evident, it's a non-place, right? It's not a land, it's literally sea, right? So, um, what matters there is, as the same name says it, is that it's defined by land as a sea, because it's within the lands, it's th that, that's exactly what, what it means, right? So, those lands are what really focused the attention of, of historians, as we'll see now. Um, and um, there is a cultural archetype that we attributed to it, therefore that is dangerous, because it, it focuses on the Mediterranean and as, as a monad, as a single thing, and it, it doesn't concentrate on the fact that there is nothing in the Mediterranean. It's all around that there are countries that, that did stuff in the Mediterranean, which is a different stuff, or through the Mediterranean, even better. It's a mental state. Right, it's a sort of exotic idea, like oh, the Orient, mm, like uh, the North, the South, the East, the West, whatever the hell they mean. Um, and um, and there is a great, uh, as, as we were saying, modern responsibility in this. Think about the travels of the Grand Tour during the modern age. All the the coolest kids, the the privileged families in Europe, toured around, especially the Mediterranean. Italy and Greece, looking at these great, uh, you know, monuments. It, it was an archaeological fashion, right? Uh, for even there for different reasons. F for example, think about, um, you know, Greece was under the Ottomans, and it wasn't dramatically developed. Italy at that time was very developed, and not only, but it, it, wa it was developed because it had had the Renaissance, and it had therefore emphasized the continuity with classical times. So not just they had all the ruins, the stuff, etc., but they had an advanced culture that was kind of classicist, uh, the same Italian is, you know, similar to Latin. I mean, the, the, there was a permanence of, of a great legacy in that sense. Uh, and therefore, the, the classical myth spread from there in ways that were maybe modern, more modern rather than, than, than ancient at some levels. Um, or even medieval at some point, um, because even medieval times it was mostly from Italy that things began in the humanistic uh, kind of sense to look at the classical past most. Um, uh, even though yes, the Alexander uh, Alexandrian epic was surely more important than the I don't know the the the, chival the Christian one in the Middle Ages, but not just for the Christians, also for the Muslims uh, up to Southeast Asia. Um, the, Though that's another thing, but let's say, uh, think about Forster that says that Mediterranean was the measure of uh, of all men, like the human norm, when he writes Passage to India, right? And this is probably the best classicistic synthesis. Classicism is bad, right? Like everything that ends in ism has something wrong in it, because it stresses excessively a concept that should be mitigated. Forster wrote between the two wars, right? So we're very recent times, and and think about that. You know, think about in Cambridge, they think they still that they're the essentially the greatest uh, collectors of the classical legacy, right? The this idea. Think about yeah. I mean, the British Empire, the idea that first were of the great Western empires. You know, first the Romans, then etc. And the British Empire now was the peak of that, and that. In the 19th century, that's what the positivism, positivism we're talking about. This need to stress there had been a classical civilization that fundamentally flowed, that emerged, flowed into other countries that flourished and uh, represented the, you know, uh, the the kind of leaders in this sector. Also, this informed actually and, and displeasantly many. Many of the, those prejudices were were saying before. For example, justifying the fact that the Mediterranean had lost importance uh, in, uh, I mean, since the modern age, uh, in favor of, of course, countries like, like, you know, like Spain, France, England, the Netherlands, etc., that had, you know, because of the Atlantic route, created empires, um, and uh, that therefore they, they needed to justify the fact that 
you know, the Mediterranean was was cool but corrupted. I mean, think about Gibbon, right? The uh, his work is it's not a bad one for the times, but it's definitely imbued with with a with a concept of of decadence at the end of the day. It is deeply moral, um, moralistic, let's say better. And that still makes people think that it's fundamentally the the, the Eastern um, pollution, you know, the Great Western Greek Roman values that made those civilization collapse. And this is, you know, a racist idea at best, and has e not even anything to do with what actually happened. Telling you the truth, because if anything, the Roman Empire, by the way, continued in in the East for, for much longer. Uh, and while the Latin Germanic structures were struggling for centuries, while you know, I don't know, the Caliphate of Cordoba, for example, was a was a was a real state. Um, so no, um, but it, it not because the Latin Germanic structures were that bad either from from a context point of view, contextual point of view. That is to say, you have to understand why they had arrived at that point, and uh, it's not because of necessarily of a dramatic, um, you know, reason as we tend to do today. The, the Dark Ages didn't weren't quite dark at all, right? Um, maybe just for the sake of documentation, but the idea of darkness is it's kind of you know historically very debatable um, what is important to stress is that the ancient Mediterranean throughout all its history was not just a western sea that's the main point that we tend to forget uh, it it became it like so because of classicistic transfigurations between the mid uh, 18th and the beginning of the 20th century there was this f formidable and forced cultural and political westernization that not only limited itself to invest the you know Europe as we as was at the time but that involved um, the image also of, of the remote past and this shift had the evident aim to legitimize the primacy of the new um, colonialist and in industrial Europe, right, and it produced an effect that, for from a certain perspective, was paradoxical, because as we have seen, the Mediterranean had already lost weight and importance in the new, um, you know, world pol politics uh, and 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 uh, economy. We could say um, to the advantage of the the Atlantic for sure, um, but. In in directly in a directly proportional way, this had exalted its it, you know the historical value of the, of the Mediterranean as a sort of genetical place, as a sort of ideal laboratory of a Western universe that you know it was represented in a kind of uh, a completely fictitious. And um, uh, let's say self autonomy and isolation. The ancient Mediterranean wasn't wasn't that, right? And this is easy to understand, even through banal but not so banal examples, such as the fact that I don't know Augustus in Rome was considered a princeps, so he was de facto monarch, but conceptually was a primus inter pares. Whereas if he went in Egypt, he was a god just like the pharaohs, right? And this went on and on and on. He did all the emperors, uh, you know, fundamentally had this, and it never stopped. Like, it's never in the West we, we ever thought that our emperors, monarchs, were, were gods, right? So um, that's something that remained. And if there had been a unit there, you know, what, what the hell was happening in Egypt? They were, you know, used to millennia of pharaohs, like, you know, uh, or in the East, like, you know, kings of kings. There were still, however, something different. So even stressing the idea that the, the, the East was so easy to rule is uh, pr pretty problematic, especially speaking of the, the Middle East. Um, and there were other, mm, you know, th the interesting thing is that the Westerners were aware of that diversity at the time. For example, the obsession of, of, of everybody from Alexander to the Romans was India. Right, it, you know, people have to to find out the arcane ideas. Why I don't know the Romans never invaded Ireland, or you know, but, but what the hell? Like, you know, these guys were thinking only about India. 
and they were right because that would have been you know a pretty important thing to achieve of course it was kind of uh, unreachable but for those times geographical notions and ideas of course the romans at a certain point realized that they they fixed their their boundaries more or less uh, for for centuries in the same places that were mediterranean ones albeit you know they did expand in the continent in in europe as well and they made it roman as well um and this corresponds to dynamics that, of course, are more concrete than other ideas. But it's like, you know, when they, they invaded Germany. It's not, they didn't even know the land properly. They thought it was much smaller than it actually was. Uh, they didn't even know that Russia existed, for example. Um, even though in Russia they, di they did know pretty damn well Rome existed. Up to the Urals we find Roman stuff. But the... Um, uh, uh, still... Let's say we live through the myth, right? We live through a, f a falsification. Let's be honest. This is properly what what it is, um, which cancelled an essential character of the ancient sea. That is this capacity of connecting three continents, right? Uh, having this north-south, uh, east-west axis. Right, and if we think that this was all alike, that it was all compatible, homogeneous, we strip the Mediterranean of its memory and identity of frontier uh, that was actually something very like uh, even in the modern, in the early modern age, was per still perceived quite clearly as such. I mean, as Westerners, we never literally forgot. Uh, the the fact that that yes that e even at least the thing is more complex than it seems right you can if you don't know the world uh, if you know don't care much you you may think it's like all flat etc but if you start even just traveling around the Mediterranean if you read about its history you you immediately or if you look at even at the landscapes right you you understand how diverse it is but even in the same countries that that face it within them uh, so the sea as a idea of, of a connector is what we we should recover not in the sense of a necessarily of a on a flattener right but actually of, of, of a of a an important mean that could be instrumental to something right uh, and there are deep uh, even historical problems to this, meaning that, I don't know, think even about the Roman expansion itself. The Romans initially didn't want to abandon Italy. There was literally a, a senatorial political party that said we shouldn't, because they, essentially, they, they were mostly the oligarchs, the great Latifundia owners that more, were more interested in a continental expansion, because they could seize more land. They didn't want uh, sea traffics, the, you know, the cities, the middle classes to, to take you know, to develop too much, or, you know, mostly the oligarchies, new oligarchies to rise through that, because at the end of the day, it was still, you know, an aristocratic thing. Rome was never really uh, a democracy. Um, but uh, there was literally a, a jump of the frog in that sense. I mean, mostly from, a, for example, in Latin literature, the watershed is considered the first Punic War. It's like with the Romans, they were still rough, warlike, you know, kind of very military minded are gradually opened by conquering southern Italy, the, the Atlantic influence went to, to things like literature, to theater, to, to something a bit more intellectual, right? It took some time before, you know, at the time, uh, the Romans were already literate, but the idea, for example, of composing was considered like a true man cannot compose. It's effeminated if it does. You know, a true man just does war, and that's basically what the Romans have always been about, which should they change, right? We know eventually how things went, right? By in two centuries, uh, basically, the, uh, the, the Roman elite went to study in Greece and to be, mm, let's say, if not bilingual, but still, you know, pretty much imbued in that kind of, you know, classical, you know, mostly the, uh, uh, you know, and also a Hellenistic at that point, also taste that surely think about Scipio and the resistance that corresponded to even political models right 
uh, even the says uh, the Caesar receipt was were, were yeah they were not democra true democratic ears they they look at Greece and saying ah you know look at the times uh, you know the true uh, republics and uh, the people the rules but if they had come to rule if they hadn't been defeated they would have still been Roman oligarchs slash warlords just like the the one that they had they had taken out um, so um, let's say that. The Romans were, of course, not just the only protagonists, and this is exactly the point we're making here. Uh, the culminating point of the integration was certainly the Roman one, right? Alexander invaded Asia, not to be serene. He would have liked to seize some of it, and some of his successors, such as Pyrrhus, for example, were to, you know, he, he would have liked to invade Carthage, for example. Um, but uh, I mean uh, Alexander was literally planning that after Arabia before dying you know he would have eventually passed to, to Carthage and eventually to India right that was the plan uh, so that was important but what did Alexander actually care about I don't know even Italy proper if not the Greek city states of the south or you know even more in the interlevel what was the pur the purpose, right? You know, when the gates of the east and the most imaginable richest, one of the greatest ba agricultural basins in the world was, was could be subjugated, like in India. It did make sense, right? It was not a delusion, right? Politically, strategically, India was th the thing. Um, surely the Greeks, uh, in their intellectual superiority, had, mm, you know, mm, had... Mm, generated the the idea um, of the internal sea right Herodotus already had an idea of that kind Plato Timaeus right uh, they called Mediterranean actually the internal sea mm -hmm. um, the the great changer as we were saying before was mostly uh, for 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 all the for the Roman expansion was the second Punic War Mm -hmm. Many people are convinced that the Romans would have uh, taken off anyway. This is actually not true, right? Um, the Carthaginians did have a shot not to conquer Italy because they were saying before still uh, that was too rich and overpopulated. But to break the Roman system, yes, to, to make the Allies revolt, they had a chance, right, up to a certain point, right, up to the, Meta the Battle of the Metaurus River. They had the, op they, the, the Romans risked, at least we know historically, that it was a thing. Um, there is no deterministic rise of Rome here, and 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 stressing it is basically denying the the uniqueness and the specificity of the Roman um, capacities that are that didn't just you know set on you know autopilot and they, they conquered uh, the Mediterranean. The history doesn't work like that. Um, um, there would be a lot of interesting stuff to say about this, even how the the the, the the, the the rate the pace which the Romans made this that you know was was not even entirely successful like for example the second century BC was a moment of even of uh, of the f which the Romans were on the defensive at some level right because they they stopped expanding at some point they had to make an example such as you know raising to the ground Carthage for no reason at that point if not political for for deterrent reason because they were making money well with it uh, after the second Punic War. But especially Corinth, that was a bit a, a symbol of it. one of, was one of the great Hellenistic capitals, was actually way more shockingly devastating than from a mental uh, psychological point of view for the entire world at the time, because the Romans had up to that point followed in the you know, footsteps of Alexander and said, "Okay, we just invade the world without touching anybody, but just you know because the glory of the the military deity of the sky has will will." make everybody bow in front of us because of our might and our power uh, it did serve right that it's also uh, a pretty brutal lesson in real politic right that is to say the Romans didn't kill people because they were evil it's just because they didn't give a shit about them <laughs> right, right like anybody at the time and they were pretty damn good at that you know because they had the means of doing it and they did it and it worked so is this called civilization unfortunately yes like, we wouldn't like it to be like that, but sh surely, you know, uh, that played a part. Um, let's say that um, 
the Second Punic War did, however, make the Romans take off indeed in the way we, we intend, and literally to open to the Mediterranean dimension for real. Up to that point, they had seized Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, but it wasn't the Mediterranean proper. Um, it was still, you know, fairly easily reachable lands, and still they created some perplexity along the, the conservative party. Um, Scipio embodied dramatically the kind of the Hellenistic model, so much that eventually was under trial and even exiled because of it. But he was the one that made the thing, because if it hadn't been for him, they would have had, you know, Punic Wars over and over again. Right? He was the set of, like, let's bring again war in Africa for the last time, let's and it worked, right? And not only that, they invaded Greece, they 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 defeated the Seleucids. So it, it's something that, under his guidance, or his influence at least, you know, opened the way to, to a new model of power as well, right? Roman, Rome was never the same thing all the time. It changed, and even very deeply. The Second Punic War contributed to that dramatically, especially after Cannae, when, you know, the true, let's say, cream of the Roman nobility was consistently weakened from literally a demographic point of view because of the butchery of that battle and the kind of newcomers began to fill the Senate once again that were mostly interested in cash and fast didn't have much of the older mores right even if they you know that's also debatable but it did create a political problem in the second sanctuary BC including the, including the recruitment one uh, that's how messed up it did uh, go at some level um so um indeed from this time on there is probably a Mediterranean unity from a political point of view. That is, Rome is there. The Romans objectively expand just in the Mediterranean. If you look at this time, they didn't have any interest even to go deep into other territories. If you wonder why they it took so much to conquer Spain, for example, it's because they didn't have political motivation, right? It's not that they didn't have the resources, it's just they, yes, they had a crisis of recruitment, but there was mainly a political, pro internal political problem of Rome. They were full of resources, it's just they didn't want to waste them in things that were not uh, convenient for the oligarchy at that point. Things changed later on, where more ambitious uh, individuals began to exploit the, the, the new changes. Um, but... From there on, it was clear that basically no other power was threatening Rome, right? Rome, in this point, it was even faced important crisis. There was, I don't know, think about the Nominian War. I mean, yeah, even in the war in Spain, was pretty. it's what mostly uh, exacerbated the re recruitment um, crisis. It was a bit like the Vietnam War. Um, they had problems in Numidia. They had problems in uh, in the East, broadly meant in the sense that they had to cope with uh, you know some rebellions in, in Greece. Uh, eventually, the slaves won in, in Italy as well. But I don't know. Think about Pontus, um, even Armenia at some point. But at the end, they always won, right? Because they simply had the, the they had the greatest force, and and they it was too inconvenient for them not to act, and. Uh, but it was a Mediterranean dimension, and up to that point, they didn't care, for example, to expand in the Gallic interland, or even in the Asian, when the Balkans, you know, everything was seizing the richest places and, and making big money. Kind of makes sense, right? Also because those places were politically weak, uh, and it was easy for the bigger guy to, to, to swallow them, and in the process, Rome also got Hellenized, um, in part, but why? Well, because it had encompassed exactly that Mediterranean stripe, right? It's exactly what we were saying before about the, 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 the interland penetration of Hellenic culture that mostly overlapped with this, right? But it's not because they cared much about the interland, nor, nor, and this is often forgotten, even the Romans were much influenced in that sense. That is, the elites were Hellenized, yes, but, I don't know, if you look at the Italic peasantry, even the one in southern Italy, where that lived like 30 miles away from from the the Atlantic cities of the coast, just like in the rest of the continent, uh, th there wasn't actually a great change. Those always spoke Italic. They it was never like you know a chunk of Italy that I don't know spoke Greek. Uh, it was just the coasts. That th that's the Greek world, right? And that continued over and over. It, it's something that went on up to the mi the, the mid Middle Ages. But the interland was never like that.
and that tells you even you know at that point how you know how different in fact the Mediterranean countries could remain in spite of literally a coin that did exist along the coast like that and that's where the greatest culture civilization technology that passed right but that were aimed fundamentally at catalyzing just in the main centers and in the elites but the people those who broke their backs in the fields like that the, in, in all in pre-industrial societies what did they know about that right especially the more the latifundum oligarchy took over in in the business in the life of the state they they, they implemented ever more the city um, say as the fulcrum of, of the Roman domination the, the countryside was relatively isolated this is something you see uh, in the same Roman Empire that there, there are lands that remained under Roman control for half of a millennium and that basically displayed very low uh, sometimes not even properly a level of Romanization this is true even in places were very close to uh, like I don't know think about northern Spain or Armorica Brittany, uh, certain areas of Britain, or even the Anatolian interland with considering the surrounding Greek culture that was never substituted by the Latin one in the East. This is also not a very important thing. You know, the, the, the Anatolian interland remained kind of savage. Think about these Aurians in late Roman times even, but this is also another very important thing to realize that the Eastern Mediterranean was never Latinized, and it remained under Roman control for for a good 800 years something less they always spoke Greek so where is this unity actually whereas in the West yes uh, in the West Greek made more headway but still as we've seen Western Europe remained essentially um, Celtic Latin uh, Iberian eventually Germanic um, and yet there were important islets of, 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 of Greek, even of, um, uh, of Jewish, right? But where were they? They were in the cities, right? That even if you think about, I don't know, um, the Justinian Reconquest and the fact, uh, pick Byzantine Italy, for example, you always had this Italic kingdom that was a continental one, and then the coasts were still basically even some the city is mostly Greek speaking and literally a few kilometers a few tens of kilometers in the interland they spoke still Italic languages right and uh, so much that in you know in, you know historical times even just if you think about the Greek minorities in in southern Italy but they're numerically um, you know insignificant like why because the interland took over Right, that is a characteristic of especially of medieval Europe that basically reemerged, especially in the tenth century, from the interland, from the land, not from the sea. That, that's another important aspect. Not that the two things were not connected, because they were deeply connected, especially in certain areas. But the fact that the cultural indicators there shows you that there was a sharp divide still it means that something was solidly from one side and another solidly for, from one another and this is still Mediterranean reality um, and we again we tend to dramatically underestimate that because of course the countryside wouldn't write of course we look at the beautiful things of the cities uh, where the people the merchant the trade etc what about the peasants that made actually the whole thing work for real? Hmm? Those were the majority of the population. That is what made the uh, the culture more than we realize. The identity especially. Um, um, Polybius writes something very beautiful referring to the fact of this chaining, of this hinging of the various parts of of the Mediter of various Mediterranean lands because of Mediterranean expansion, he was photographing, if you know, exactly the moment in which Rome had seized all this Mediterranean coastline, and he said that uh, specifically the the events of Italy and Africa, or the ones of Asia and Greece, now were all intertwined. They they seemed all coordinated to a single end. 
which was the Roman Empire. Um, and it's the it, he, it, it's important because Polybius identifies the sea as properly the u the unity of the wall, right? Uh, and 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 yet this this unity will not cancel the differences of places of environments of peoples, right? Um, and on the contrary, if you look at the Roman imperial policy, you see the very attemptive. Uh, different attitudes that they had towards all the various peoples they were dealing with. The Romans didn't deal with the Gauls as they did; they dealt with the Greeks, or with the Egyptians, or with the uh, with the Carthaginians. Right? They, they were all different uh, needs, right, and policies uh, that sometimes took a very, um, let's say. Uh, it's obvious that if I expand on such a a major land mass like Gaul, I'm going to cope very differently than if I do with a maritime empire like the one of uh, of Carthage, right? Um, so it's literally a deeply different models of leadership, of 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 of, of rule. And um, Strabo and Pliny. Um, observed this for example very well but they didn't in they they observed how uh, this was in a single frame this was also part of the deal of of roman imperial ecumenism the idea that the romans had conquered the world literally that was functional to their politics to their propaganda and from their perspective they were right right doesn't matter that they hadn't liter conquered literally the globe because that world was what objectively was known at the time. Um, even if the new other lands existed, no other empire had ever achieved anything like this on such a long run, right? And with that degree also of uniformity of control, because even if you pick, I don't know, the Achaemenid Empire that had its own important, uh, not didn't last so long as the Roman one, but you know, it still was massive in terms. Of, you know, well, the the degrees of control were very um, were much more shaded. Also, there was a, a very different um, model of of of, uh, of of leadership and of um, and of rule, but it was more unstable, especially in certain areas. Uh, the Romans were had it fairly easy. I mean, they basically controlled always the you know the places they conquered. Right, uh, they they began to lose them at some point, but it was kind of linear in, in the loss because they had an internal crisis and they abandoned them themselves. You know, they they gave up the the fight at some point. They simply entrusted to someone else. Right, other empires were always struggling to actually crush, not revolts like I don't know the Jewish wars, or but literally you know, you know, trying to tame uh, a vassal that was de facto already autonomous and ruling as an autonomous ruler in their command. The Romans never quite did that. On the contrary, they, at the end of the day, they began to absorb all the various vast client states that they couldn't even defend themselves anymore. And that's also why the Roman Empire was a real state, in in at least in, by ancient standards, um, compared to other creations. And what the hell, it lasted so long. It, it's unbelievable. Uh, definitely, the Mediterranean contributed, even with some. You know that I'm not a fan of geopolitics because I don't think it really, it's really a useful way of, of looking at at history. But still, it favored uh, even contacts, you know, and uh, uh, you know ex expeditions and so on. So, it was obviously it was helping in that regard, no doubt. Um, and it would be. Um, an imperial geographer and scholar, Julius Solinus, that lived around uh, 200 AD to in actually invent the name of Mediterranea Maria. So, literally, actually, the Mediterranean seas, right? And more and more specifically, uh, th this was eventually, you know, he he came up with that, and the reason why we uh, was eventually resumed and fixed definitely. Uh, in, in Western 
in the Western lexicon is because of Isidore of Seville in the early Middle Ages in his etymologies. But before Solinus, nobody had come up, apparently, at least in, from the known literature, to join such a terrestrial adjective like Mediterraneus, which in Latin literally means uh, in the mid of the lands, uh, that, that is literally even more stronger, right? It means rooted in the center of the earth, right? To such a, a, an aquatic substantive such as sea. And it's fascinating that he speaks of Maria at plural, meaning that, yeah, it was a single thing, but still it was made up of different seas, right? Which is also understandable because the Mediterranean, as we were saying before, is very different, even just environmentally speaking. Um, so, how did the Romans make it? Well, of course it was a political thing. You know, th there is even a sort of economical miracle. I mean, the Romans, when they conquered, at the time of Augustus, like, nobody, even, not even Alexander, ever ha ha ever concentrated such a sheer amount of wealth under single control, right? Uh, and this allowed the Romans to establish a net of relations, of, of, of compatibility, of exchanges between different systems that did take on an osmotic character. Uh, the Romans did Romanize, um, importantly, large areas of Mediterranean, and we are less aware of it than what we think, mostly because of the shift that we were saying before about Europe, that the fact that eventually as Westerners we, we concentrated on the fact that you know, the West shifted towards the North, so we, it, it's Europe proper that maintained this kind of Roman legacy, and we don't think that, I don't know, countries like, I don't know, Tunisia or Morocco or Algeria or Libya, uh, for example, have a dramatic Roman uh, legacy, uh, or that even the, the East... Um, largely meant has an important role. We, we needed to invent the fact it was a Byzantine Empire, for example, to distinct to say that it wasn't Roman in a way, which which is hurtful, honestly. Uh, we made videos about this and you know that I'm not completely against the, the historiographical use of the term Byzantine at this point in history, but not because I, I attach any actual meaning to it. That was Rome. Point. End of the story. No debate of any possible sort. Right, it's just for the sake of brevity, of simplicity, we know what we're talking about. It's easier. Uh, and there were differences, but yes, that was still Rome. But think about even the, you know, the idea that at that point Romanity had become Christianity. Think about the Copts in Egypt. Think about um, the, Christ, uh, the Syrian Christians. Think about, um, you know, how much Roman stuff, I mean, Roman age stuff, you know, the Byzantine stuff, the, there's in Turkey, for example, that today we don't see definitely as a as a Roman thing, but definitely the Ottoman Empire took an enormous amount of Roman uh, legacy of symbolism, and many people will deny it, because no, it's not true, it's all different. It's actually not true, and the reason why is that they called themselves Caesars, among, you know, sultans, all this stuff, and, and that's not something you can deny, especially when in Constantinople there was still, you know, a, properly a Roman Christian community that worked for the Ottomans. Now, and there will be so much to say about this, as you understand, but we can't do it. There is another aspect of the unpleasant ones, that is the spread of slavery, right? That in Roman times reached um, unparalleled dimensions which goes in parallel with the concept of wealth there, we stress the fact that Romans built an empire like that, that they needed it, in, in a sense. Um, that's the reason why they didn't pass to, it's not because they weren't Greeks, because if the world had remained in the hands of the Greeks, they would have invented steam and no. Because the reasons of an empire are not the ones of a, sm a small, you know, yet ri very rich city-state that has just to you know, impress a sovereign by creating uh, a water or steam mechanism that works just to open a door, right? Uh, slavery was by far the, the, the cheapest and the most convenient form of labor force that could be found at the time, right? Even a different distribution of, of wealth uh, in, in a world that 
mm, crop rate, uh, you know, with that level of you know per per, per, per capita wealth, would have been would have would have not brought to the need of uh, investing too much in machinery. The same Romans did at some point. Like there were windmills, there, there were I mean those existed from Sumerian times. But uh, once again, um, don't don't ever think that. Of course, that societies always do the most functional things, but also don't ever think that if they they do just randomly a stupid thing that you know they they should have changed for because you think so. Because if that empire is being built by people who use slaves in large mass, and basically every people in the world use slavery, from the smallest tribes to 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 to, to the ecumenic empires, I mean there is a reason there that. You, you should be able to identify in the same fact that those empires existed and where those levels of development and had emerged in the first place. Uh, the Romans didn't invent slavery, um, uh, nor were the last ones to use it. And, and um, the world changed in ways that are also not easy to read, but definitely that cannot, uh, that should be listened to and observed and trying to be understood, even if it's very difficult. So the Roman Empire was, in fact, not just a, a sea of noblemen, of merchants, but um, not least than the Atlantic of the 18th century was a, a sea of slaves, right? And more than once of slaves in revolt, even though, you know, it didn't end well <laughs> for them, right? And the Romans in that regard actually were pretty pragmatic as well, right? Um, crucified them all uh, on the Appian Road. And actually, in, in that sense, uh, it was more than, than as, you know, it was not the slaves, Right, Spartacus was not the brave, uh, you know, proud thing that wanted to to create a new life. They were just martyrs. They wanted to 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 break free from a society that was oppressed. And those were even slaves. Some of them were Roman citizens that were oppressed by the Latifundia owners. Um, they the, the 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 those revolts are much more similar to peasant revolts than actual slave revolts, right? Um, more problematic at some point was piracy that also the Romans dispensed of quite effectively and until you know the third century crisis objectively we don't know of revolts of slave revolts of pirates I mean they they couldn't do much in that world unfortunately for them so after Polybius the Romanization of the Roman Empire would have been ever more Mediterranean in character, indeed, at least in the sense that that the, its el elites would have been first of all Mediterranean, and this means that they expressed an idea of synthesis, where the uh, native uh, Roman and Italic elements mm, blended, you know, fused with the you know both the the Atlantic but also the decisively Eastern. Uh, acquisitions, we, we could say, um, not even an Italian identity exists. I mean, you know, you know that the term Italian is a, is used to uh, just from a geographical point of view at that time, because uh, there there were not just Italic peoples in the peninsula. So that when you talk about the Celts, the Ligurians, the, I don't know, the, even there were some Illyrians. Um, the Etruscans, etc. You know, altogether, there is no common thing. So the only common thing was, geogra you know, the, the modern boundaries of ge geographical boundaries of, of Italy. So okay, they they are called Italian, right? But even Italy that was created as such by the Romans, right, uh, as their own special uh, elective province, was was uh, was something very complex, and it wasn't Romanized in the same way. For example, the Po Valley that was nothing but Cisalpine Gaul was never fully integrated in the Mediterranean traffic. Like I don't know, uh, Etruria was more similar to to southeastern Gaul. Uh, that was one of the most radically Romanized provinces of the Wall Empire, and uh, then then then. Cisalpine Gaul, right? The Romans did colonize it, did urbanize it, and so on. It wasn't like other, let's say, more peripheral areas, but it, it still was different, for example, in its unit. Um, 
and um, you know this can be observed even from the distribution of ur urbanization which is a very interesting there is a map inserted here somewhere um, there were also and this is a topic that I really care about the uh, already the splits between east and west in a sense that as we've seen had never been united because what did the, the Roman Empire actually do in that sense. Um, there was never a Latinization of the East proper. It was a Romanization in the ecumenical sense, meaning that every subject there could become a Roman citizen at some point, but not quite a union, an homogenization, a uniformation. When you think about the uh, the Caesars civil war, uh, or the one of the Caesar recedes eventually, and even the one between Octavian and Anthony. You always see a pattern there that is east and west, right? Like the more, the poorer but more military powerful west against the, um, say, softer but richer east. Uh, and all three times the west won. You can see a pattern there, it's not that simple, right? Uh, things could have gone differently. Also, the, let's say, the Eastern, um, let's call them Romans, that's why I, I detest the term for both for when, as a substitute for the Byzantines, you can't imagine for, <laughs> for what I'm trying to say now, because the myth that, I don't know, for example, Antony was a Orientalist obsessed, no. Um, in many ways, you know, Antony was way more Caesarian than Octavian in many ways. He was a true Roman. It was nothing like an, an Easternization of the Romans in that sense. That's the Augustian propaganda that it was brilliant and excellent. And, uh, and it's a testament. The fact that people still believe it today is a testament to its greatness. Uh, but it's, we know historically it, it was different. Um, and we, we do see the, uh, the strength of of the Roman uh, system in there, uh, in, in these outcomes. Uh, in, in this clash that invested basically all levels of Roman politics, society, and military, in those specific. Um, eventually, as you know, the, the West declined before the East, um, because probably they both declined the same way, but the East was more structurally advantaged and the Romans in the West had exhausted kind of the military potential right because people had gentrified or impoverished eventually especially in lo late Roman times um, and they didn't have many resources to to cope with for example the barbarian invasions and so on but even that is you know uh, there, there was more of a blending at the end of the day and and it's as if there was a, there had been a, as we were saying before a sort of say of substitution rather than uh, of, of, of the elites rather than a change in the nature of the West. Um, this is quite important even for medieval developments that we, s we discussed widely today we talk about just ancient history. Uh, in other words there was a Latin West and a Greek East um, that eventually were coupled let's say the Latins with the Germans and the Greeks with the Slavs in Europe uh, and um, that were to form, if you want, it's difficult to call two different civilizations, even this is a two, um, you know, it's an excessive split, because there was some that was surely a Celtic legacy in the West, for example, uh, there was surely also an e a much greater Eastern e or Pontic influence as well, from the steps in, in the in the east and where by the way where does the west and the east begin because frankly if you look uh, even in the full middle ages you look at a land like germany you start having difficulties there to say exactly where it was a frontier still um so we know how eventually things went to from the 13th century onwards it's as if the west took over again right in all the models uh, it, it's frankish feudal society but not just that that you know expands dramatic its, its consequences mostly that this is a wholly different topic I made a video a long time ago which was called like I think the Carolingian and a uh, in, in, in Abbasid 
the Carolingian Empire in a, in a Basid Caliphate comparison, why, you know, at the end of the day, the Frankish legacy lived on and the Caliphs eventually collapsed, right? Th that is, that is imp I mean, not because the Carolingians remained uh, in, in charge, actually, they were meteor meteorical on, on the longer run, but the, how much did the Franks impact with the Vassalitic beneficiary structures of Europe, and whereas, you know, the, the Muslims didn't actually change much in the local um, regional traditions, they mostly kind of built upon them, um, but, you know, not altering them significantly in, um, for example, in terms of economical competitiveness, whereas the West took off, literally, and even the Byzantines basically lost it. So there is something specific to Western Europe there that, that needs to be seen, and that had important consequences for the Mediterranean too, because that was keeping being Florida and even a kind of alternative to feudalism. Think about the city states during the you know in the Middle Ages, the enormous wealth, but those were literally the richest communities in the world. Mm -hmm. Even if Europe was still not more advanced than places like China, um, for example. Um, so the important aspect though is that surely during Roman times the, the West remaining uh, remained open to cul culturally to the East it was a spread widespread bilinguism of Greek and Latin that characterized stab you know steadily the uh, ruling classes of the empire since the first century was um, perhaps the most evident um, sign of the realization of, of such a koine. So, speaking of late Roman times, which is difficult, let's say, what happened between especially the 4th and the 5th um, definitely brings to, to a separation of the two halves, right? Some historians have seen this as a sort of end of the sea, as a, of the Mediterranean, as a place of contact and meeting. Um, I disagree with this. For, for a number of reasons. First of all, that unity never came less, right? Not, not even, and uh, not at this point, not even later on, when the Mediterranean was literally politically split between the Christians and the Muslims, because trade continued. It didn't, never stopped. The Jews, the Italians, they always made it true. It was never uh, an end. And actually, they, they, you know, speaking of what we were saying before, the Italian city-states, for example, those made it for the West to rise dramatically. They, 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 are, they were the ones that shifted the trade balance, who made Europe accumulating more gold uh, than the Muslims and surpassed them. In, you know, and so you, you understand how false this idea is of the break, of the dramatic siege of Europe. It didn't quite happen that way. It was dramatically more fluid, and from that clash but meeting also rose essentially what we see as the, the finest of, of medieval civilization as probably a European one. Um, so even if it doesn't work like that. Also it's very debatable that especially for the Eastern Mediterranean 4th to the 5th century I mean for the Eastern Mediterranean countries that was such a great period of decline right and that world always owned the Mediterranean, like even if the Western Euro European countries, uh, the Western Mediterranean countries would see better because Africa, for example, was still a dramatically advanced area from an economical, cultural point of view. Um, the, um, uh, let's say, indeed, the West, especially with the Germanic invasions, kind of remained more anchored to the interland, whereas the Byzantines continued to control, at least up to the Islamic invasions, the sea. Look at Justinian Reconquest. They received basically all those countries that could support that late antique model. The coasts mainly. What did they do in, in, in Italy, in Africa, in Spain? They just seized the places where they were the richest, the most urbanized, and that in fact were more connected to the sea. Right? Um, not even the more populated, as we've seen, because it was the interland that was more populated. They didn't need to spend money. It was enough at that point with the shrinking of resources, etc., to, to, to maintain such important strongholds like fortified cities in these heavily urbanized realities, 
because in the Mediterranean during the early Middle Ages cities never died. It was not like in Northern Europe that they almost even disappeared at some level, right? Um, they were abandoned even in some cases. Um, okay, it was not even so tragic there, but surely, you know, I mean, if you look at Britain, it's made, you know, kind of the most extreme case, it's something. Uh, but even in Northern Gaul, right, there was a decline. But still, if you look at places like Southern Gaul, Italy, Spain, uh, where's the break with Roman times in terms of urbanization? There is really not, right? Uh, there are important moments of crisis, especially in Italy, but still the city stands there, and it will remain, because basically all, even the, you know, the, there were other foundations, but the, the core of the diocesan net, etc., it's what remained historically to, throughout all, even to up to modern times. So, it was around the city, right? And this is indeed something that in the rest of Europe you don't quite you don't quite find it the same way, uh, if not in the southwestern area. Um, so, I don't buy the idea that the sea was uh, becoming a barrier and a board. Also, I don't believe at all, at all, that there was a precious patrimony of integration and pluralism that was lost, and that it would have never been refound. Right, that's a myth. If anything, I believe the Roman Empire, uh, the the antique, the, the ancient world in general, didn't have so much potential like the later one. Um, things did change, but it was from that crisis, from that contrast, that actually uh, things like diversity increased. I mean, how diverse was medieval Europe compared to, you know? ancient times, right? It was, like, the, it's fascinating because it, it, it was both more homogeneous and more different at the same time. And that is, in my opinion, the recipe for oh, uh, a very deep capacity of expansion, as, in fact, it happened because medieval civilization blossomed into, eventually, the Renaissance, while late antiquity died with, or at least, you know, even if this this is not as we've seen true for all places, but it shrank so much to the point that the transformations that happened were enough to transfigure it in, in a certain way. So, indeed, however, on the long run, the persistence of a let's say of a Christian Europe and a Muslim Africa, for example, um, separated the East and Africa from the European West and North, right? So, um, the that is in perspective on the long run what happened, and the Ottomans especially boosted dramatically the concept of Western and modern Europe, because if it hadn't been for those invasions, probably Europeans would have not had the same degree of, let's say, of in, of, of collective identity as they have today. Not the Western, properly as we as we narrowly define Western Europe wouldn't quite exist but I believe that still um, the during the Middle Ages that um, division helped to to make both sides grow like if you look at up to the 13th century especially even I mean Christians Muslims Muslims Jews were Growing from even a common uh, back cultural background. I mean, think about all the uh, Hellenistic legacy that the uh, the Muslims secured and you know capitalized upon. Uh, the Jews were basically you know across the two uh, religions still living you know this person this way. The Christians still, of course, looking at the, the Christian uh, you know uh, the classical background. So. They all three developed on the same basis, right? Think about Maimonides, Thomas Aquinas. Um, think about the Aristotelianism coming from, you know, the elaborations of Avicenna, etc. So that that was largely still a common civilization. This brutalistic historical opinion, for which you know the early Middle Ages brought this great break, this rupture, this collapse, this dramatic, it's an it's an invention. It's an invention that served to justify uh, 
the idea that there was such an enormous civilization that that fell because it was so unique and and solid and one and uh, uh, you know integral it had never been like that the Mediterranean has always been different within itself and it kept being different and that was the sap of its richness of its uniqueness this context uh, this uh, constant exchange meeting clash learning that's how you boost a civilization and and that that's how Europe was a bit as we've seen in itself because it was different it was diverse China for example didn't have this China the Chinese managed to flatten everything at a certain point and this was difficult because it was somebody who could switch the lights off like what would happen in the 17th century when they decided to stop to make transoceanic travels expeditions and while so leaving it to the Europeans just because of an internal clash between two parties one of which controlled the navy that lost and that therefore you know so the Chinese uh, maritime resources dismantled in that sense Europe could never be like that because well was always in competition was always dynamic right in in a chapter that we have eliminated from this is also went because we, we are more attentive to the Atlantic route is still seeing how lo for how long the Mediterranean actually remained active how much it is still now in many ways um, and how the even the the the, the strong, you know, the bitter struggles between the northern and the uh, southern um, countries of the Mediterranean still pass through a reciprocal, you know, enrichment in a sense. Um, Europe had basically uh, always the upper hand, except between the seventh and the, let's say, the tenth, eleventh century, right? From there on. You know, it was always even their slavery, but still enrichment. It was like a big the Viking era, right? What was the Viking era about? Slavery. It was fundamentally based on a major traffic of slaves from Christian countries like, sold to, into the, the Muslim East by the Vikings. That that's basically how it worked, um, and it did bring to something, right? Even if those were some of the poorest regions in Europe, but it still managed to do some to achieve something that you know compared to just 1000 uh, years before it's amazing for northern european standards um and it favored further integration and you know the reception of you know the culture from from the south from from the mediterranean still because that was still the center of of of, of those um you know uh of civilization let's be honest about it um and yeah, I, th I think this is the concept broadly meant, and of course it's, um, I mean, I realize it's controversial in part, but uh, I think it's worth uh, reflecting on it, because even certain differences that we trace today, for example, between Northern and Southern Europeans, this idea that, ah, you know, there, there was a time which the Southerners had it, and now it's the North, uh, and there is all the... the, the the weirdest, sometimes literally racist explanations for it that have basically nothing to do with any kind of, even if historical evidence, if it had been just for from an anthropological or point of view, but um, that do not even try to pass through the fact that there was, um, let's say, a path of this kind, there was an improvement of this time, and then this is... Um, it, it, it's somewhat challenging, right? And it, it, it especially makes you wonder about uh, the the uniqueness of certain traits that cannot be said as a constitutive original character of Europe, right? Because up to some point, that was one of the, the least developed continents in the world, at least in Eurasia for sure. I mean, India and Ch China did you know, the Middle East had done consistently better. This is in the moment in which Europe revives through the Mediterranean and that creates something that changed the world in, in a way that was unexpected given those previous bases and that came to by the 19th century to basically dominate the world and it passed through this. It passed through what happened in this moments and it must be very carefully observed because it, it, it is not 
or random. I mean, somebody did it, right? It can't be a deterministic reality. Um, it, it, it is something that somebody decided to do or managed to do. I had the capabilities of doing it, the resources of doing it. And, okay, more of that to come because I may also make some book review on these topics and I and I'm interested to discuss them. But for now, we just stop it here. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. Uh, I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.